Alexa, turn on AC 200L, direct current. Okay. Hi, and welcome back to Waveform Science. I am your host, Jeff Hagen. Tonight we're going to take a look at the newest update to the AC200 series from Bluetti, the AC200L. Uh, this machine continues their flagship series starting in 2020 with the AC200, the original one, uh, moving on to, in 2021, the AC200P and the AC200 Max. Uh, this is now the AC200L. A uh, number of things have changed and a number of things have stayed the same. So what hasn't changed? Well, the size of the battery... 2048 watt hours. It's been roughly a 2000 watt hour battery since the series first started. So that part hasn't changed. Pretty much the rest of it has. Um, inverter's bigger at uh, 2400 watts as opposed to 2200 watts or 2000 watts, depending on which other model you're looking at. Uh, so much bigger inverter. Uh, no charging brick, uh, charges directly off the wall. Uh, you do need a special cable from them, which we'll cover in a moment, uh, but that's that's different. Uh, two USB power delivery ports uh, with a caveat that we'll talk about later. Uh, it still has a high amperage DC port, but it's different now and we need to talk about it, which we will. Uh, and we're going to benchmark the heck out of it. So uh, before we get into all of that, what does it come with in the box? So it comes with, of course, the AC200L itself. It comes with the uh, instruction manual. And warranty card. It comes with the solar charging cable, which is exactly the same as the one that they use on the AC200 Max, except now a different color. Other than that, identical. Uh, it comes with the uh, cigarette lighter charging cable. Um, again, exactly identical to what they ship with the AC200 Max. Um, and yay, no more power brick. It comes with the charging cable. Now, this charging cable is not a standard computer power cable. As you can see, it's a custom connector. Bluetti makes them. Weepu technically makes them. Uh, but it's a uh, custom connector, um, which I don't mind. Uh, they use the computer power cable standard on many of their devices, the smaller ones. Uh, this one they went with a, with a different cable, a custom cable. It, but I don't mind because this cable can actually charge faster than a computer power cable connector can support which means if they use the computer power cable standard on this device, they would have had to slow the charging down. So, yeah, different cable, but, yeah, you know, eh, it, it is what it is. Works. So, uh, let's go through it and benchmark this device and see how it behaves. Let's go through the physical ports on the AC200L. Um, first off, on the uh, AC side, we have the uh, 30 amp. This is a TT30, 120 volt output port. Uh, we've got a, uh, a positive and negative and a ground here, a positive neutral and ground technically. Uh, here we have uh, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, these are NEMA 520, 20 amp output ports, which uh, US spec, you can run a port continuously at 80% of its maximum rating. So uh, 20, 20 amps is the maximum, 16 amps, uh, which is 80% of 20, uh, is the continuous output from each one of these ports. Uh, of course, you've got a uh, 2400 uh, watt inverter, so you can't run two of these 20 amp ports at full wattage at the same time, but you can run one of them at full wattage. Uh, and you can pull all 2400 watts at the same time out of this TT30 port. So very cool there. What else do we have? We have the DC side. We've got two USB-C ports that are labeled 100 watts. We have a USB-A port, 5 volt, 3 amp. There are two of them here. Uh, doesn't say anything about quick charge. We'll test that in a few minutes. Uh, we have the new screen. Turn that on. We're going to go through that in depth, uh, comparing it to the AC200 Max in a few minutes. Uh, we've got DC output um, right here. That's a cigarette lighter jack. And in lieu of the 30 amp uh, 12 volt port, we now have an 8 amp 48 volt port. Uh, I'll be able to do some extremely limited testing on that because the cables for this port aren't available yet. Uh, let's take a look at the side. On the side of the device here, we have a PV input port right here. This is using the uh, aviation style connectors that Bluetti has used on many of their devices. In fact, it uses exactly the same connector that is uh, in the uh, AC200 Max 
and the uh, the newer, by the way, AC200Ps that now use that same connector. So that's kind of a, a good thing. Uh, next below that we have the uh, AC input port, also a three pin aviation style connector and it comes with that cable. I will call out though that it's not using, if you have one of these, it is not using the same connector as the AC300, the AC500, and the EP500 Pro. Those devices are using this connector right here. This is a, uh, a Weepu SP29, if I remember correctly, and it's bigger, so it doesn't physically fit. So if you've got those devices, this cable is not gonna work in there. It is a smaller physical size cable. Uh, this AC input cable, um, as far as I know, this is the first device they've used this physical size on. Uh, we've got a uh, grounding lug right here, uh, and we've got a uh, circuit protector device here uh, in case you need to reset the, bre the breaker. So the grounding lug is a nice addition to the later version devices. Now we move to the back. On the back we have a giant sticker in many languages that has the specs and uh, interestingly the serial number QR code of your particular device. Next we have on this side a fan and nothing else. Uh, by the way not waterproof here. Uh, if you look real close through here you can actually see the uh, the raw electronics on the inside here. Okay that's all the way around. Um, I will call out um, a bit of an inconvenience here. I mentioned earlier that it is not compatible with the AC300 or AC500 cables. This in the specs has the ability to charge at 2400 watts. And if you remember when I was talking about these outlets here, you can't pull 2400 watts from a single standard outlet. So the cable that it comes with is gonna be rated for one of these outlets. In fact, normally in your house, you have 15 amp outlets or 20 amp outlets. There's an image on your screen here of a 15 amp versus a 20 amp. A 15 amp outlet, you can actually only pull, remember, 80% of the maximum. So that's 12 amps, which by the way, is what the device is set to charge from stock from the factory, 12 amps. If you wanna charge faster than 12 amps, you have to email Blue Eddy to get a password in the app to let it charge faster. If you're gonna charge faster than a 20 amp out outlet can go, in other words, 16 amps, then you're gonna need a different cable. You're actually gonna to need to buy a different cable and that cable is not available as of the time of this recording. Uh, so what I wound up doing, because I'm an industrious person, is I made my own. Um, so here is a cable that has the, uh, the socket for the larger connector um, on one side and the uh, the port that actually plugs into the AC200L on the other side. So later on when we go through the uh, the AC charge testing and you see that I have charging numbers for 20 amps of charging, that's how I did that. I wound up making a cable. And Blue Eddy is gonna have a cable available, but at the time of this recording, that cable was not available even to the reviewers that are doing reviews, which is why you haven't seen numbers from any other reviewer yet on how fast it charges at those rates, just simply because the cable's not out yet and I'm industrious, I made my own. AC200L, similar to AC200 Max, does support expansion batteries. You can expand it with either one B230 battery or two B300 batteries or up to two of the upcoming uh, B210 batteries that aren't out yet. So how do you connect it? Well, first off, you uh, plug it into the port and then remember you have to do the locking tab there we go. Then uh, the other port on the top and the locking tab. And by the way, I've been asked, uh, can we do uh, longer connectors or rotating connectors or anything like that? Uh, well, it's the same port, so it has all the same limitations as the AC200 Max. Turn on the battery, turn on the main unit, and then we wait a while while the main unit initializes itself. And eventually the uh, battery icon is gonna show up in the uh, upper left-hand corner of the screen there that, oh, there it is, and uh, it's going to indicate that it has found the battery, and from there, we're good to go. If the battery will both charge and discharge along with the main unit. Here we're showing it charging about, uh, you know, 2,000 watts or so, um, also known as uh, four times faster than the AC200 Max could charge. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll charge the main battery, it'll discharge the main battery, it works, it works the battery just natively. 
physical dimensions of the AC200L, my tape measure says, we're looking at about uh, a little over 16 this way, uh, a little over 14 this way, and right around 11 on the, uh, on the depth. Uh, the official specifications call this out as 16.5 by 14.4 by 11.0 deep, uh, which gives us 1.5 cubic feet of volume, uh, or 1365.3, uh, uh, which doesn't have units attached to it, that's watt-hours divided by volume in cubic feet, uh, which is effectively energy density by volume. So that would be uh, watt-hours per cubic feet would be the unit there. Um, which turns out to actually be about one-third uh, more cubic feet than AC-180. AC-180 is 0.9 cubic feet by volume, and the uh, AC-200L is 1.5. And the energy density by volume of AC-200L is actually a little bit higher than AC-180. So what that means is you get uh, more watts in the same, in, in the same amount of space, uh, more watt-hours in the same amount of space. Uh, AC200 Max is a tiny bit lesser in energy density by volume, simply because the AC200L is about an inch shorter. Uh, AC200P, same thing, it's got a slightly smaller battery, a 2000 watt hour versus a 2048 watt hour, uh, and it's the same dimensions as AC200 Max, so that's going to be a tiny bit less energy dense by volume than the uh, AC200 Max. So energy density by volume is going up as we get into the newer generations of devices, and that's a good thing. My scale has the AC200L weighing in at 61.45 pounds. Uh, the specs say 61.6 pounds. Uh, my energy density by weight here is going off of the, uh, the rated specifications. I assume the difference here between theirs and mine is they have a better scale. Um, but energy density by weight is actually pretty good because the AC200P we have 33. Uh, that's uh, watt hours per, per pound. Uh, AC200 Max, we have 33.1, so it got a little bit better. AC200L, we got 33.2. Now, the dominating factor here, of course, is the weight of the batteries themselves. Um, and the lithium iron phosphate batteries have not been getting any lighter. So, uh, all of these improvements are in the, the circuitry and the casing between the 200P, the 200 Max, and the 200L. So, I'm not expecting dramatic improvements in energy density by weight as long as we stay on the same battery chemistry. Uh, note for AC300, as we go up in the model line, because the inverter head unit for AC300 is so large, the energy density by weight actually goes quite a bit down when you go up, and uh, 24.1, so there's less watt hours per unit pound, and even when you add a second battery, you're still looking at less watt hours per unit pound for the AC300. Uh, and when you look on the other side, AC180, um, we have less watt hours per unit weight for the AC180, even though it is smaller, uh, it's not as dense. So that's what I mean by energy density by weight. DC output port testing. First off, we have the 12 volt 10 amp cigarette lighter port jack. That is going to give us 13.3 volts when we're not pulling any power from it. When we up the power to 8 amps, we are going to be getting 12.4 volts. When we start pulling 10 amps, we're going to get 12.2 volts. Honestly, a little bit low there, but still within specs. Uh, and we can get all the way up to 10.9 amps before it cuts off. So that's actually very good because certain uh, devices like your diesel heaters actually overdraw the cigarette lighter outlet for a very short period of time, um, a couple hundred milliseconds, uh, as they start up. So this port will handle that overdraw just fine without cutting the port off. So compatible with those types of devices, very nice. Next, let's take a look at this new port. This is a 48 volt, eight amp DC output port. Let's look at that a little bit closer. You'll see that uh, two pins, the, uh, the top pin and the pin to the left are power outputs, and the pin to the upper right is actually a data pin, and if you just plug that into a meter, you don't get any voltage output of it. Uh, it's rated for 48 volts, but interestingly, I measure uh, 51 volts out of it. Um, and if you discharge the unit, 
uh, fully discharge it. Uh, in this case, I was using the AC output to discharge it. Uh, you'll notice that the voltage actually goes down a little bit as the internal battery uh, gets lower. So what's going on in here is it's not actually a 48 volt output, it's actually a 51.2 volt output, which is the native battery voltage. And as the battery voltage goes down when the battery is discharged, the voltage coming out of that port also goes down. So um, that has the potential of being very efficient. However, there's one problem though, it's, it's 48 volts, it's not 12 volts. Uh, most cars run off 12 volts, RVs run off 12 volts, uh, ham radios run off 12 volts. Interestingly, ham radios don't run off inverters, so they don't run off 120, they're 12 volt devices. Um, and none of these things are 48 volt devices. So there are, by the way, 48 volt devices. There's 48 volt refrigerators, there's 48 volt appliances, Those they do exist, they're just, they're kind of rare. So why do we want a 48 volt output? So let's get into that. Um, inside the AC200 Max and inside the AC200P, those units have a battery that runs at, by the way, 51.2 volts. Uh, the same as the AC200L. Inside the AC200 Max is a DC to DC voltage converter that gives us a 12 volt output on the outside of the device. Uh, which means, by the way, if we want to use that output, we now have to go through this voltage converter. Let's say I have a 24 volt system, and not a 12 volt system. Well, what I, what can I do? I can plug a, 20, a 12 volt to 24 volt up converter into the 12 volt output, but now I'm converting my voltage twice, and that's um, not very efficient. Uh, let's say instead I actually want you know the native battery voltage. Let's say I want 48 volts. Uh, well, that's going to be a problem too because now I'm converting the voltage down to, uh, to 12 volts, and then I've got to convert it back up. Neither of those are a very efficient thing to do. So this new system allows you to get access to the direct battery voltage, but the downside is, of course, every engineering decision has a trade-off, you're going to have to have your voltage converter external to the device. Just kind of is what it is. Uh, Bluetti will have a cable that plugs into this port. Uh, that cable is not available yet, and I'm industrious, so uh, I ordered the connector. Uh, this is a M19 three-pin connector, um, and I only hooked up two of the pins, uh, just the positive and negative. And you can see I can, if I plug this into just my meter and nothing else, so this block only has a meter plugged into it, nothing else, plug it into that block, you can see I get 51 volts, interestingly, even if the outputs are all turned off. So whatever's powering this thing does not appear to be controlled by these buttons here. Uh, there is a data pin on here, and uh, I'll show you one more thing. There's a current limiter. As soon as I plug this test device in, uh, the test device is turned all the way down, but it does pull a couple of uh, millivolts. So when I plug this in, immediately when I plug this in, my voltage drops to, uh, what is it, 4 volts. And why is that? Because it's trying to pull some power and there's a current limiter that's enabled. To disable the current limiter, what I'm going to have to do is hook something up to that data pin and Bluetti hasn't documented what that is. Effectively meaning I'm not really going to be able to test this port until the cable comes out. So I was able to get a reading of the voltage to determine that it is in fact native battery voltage coming out of here, which is really cool. But I don't actually know how efficient this port's going to be until I can actually pull power from it, and that's not going to happen until the cable comes out. So what are we looking at for cables? So Bluetti has announced that there will be two cables. Uh, the first cable will be effectively an official version of what I built, except the official version will actually work properly. Um, and that, that cable will be uh, weeks, not months, but I don't have an official time frame. Uh, so soon, I hope. Um, it, but it's not even available for the reviewers yet, so I can't get one to test. Uh, and that's just going to give us native battery voltage. Uh, the other device that we'll be able to get is something called the D40. And that's a device that's designed to go into an RV. And it, it's even got a solar input on it, interestingly. And it will recharge the RV's house battery system in addition to passing power from the AC200L into the RV. Uh, can be set up for multiple different battery setups, and at least that's what I've been told. Um, I don't physically have one. Uh, as far as I know, nobody physically has one outside of Bluetti's uh, factory. 
but uh, we'll have a video testing that whenever it is that it comes out. But until now, this port, uh, it's interesting. Uh, it has a lot of potential, but I wouldn't rush out and buy an AC200L today to put it in your RV until we know what the other cables are actually going to do and we have some idea of how they well they work. And just, I can't test that yet because the cable's not out yet. Uh, I do promise I will put up a video as soon as the cable arrives and we'll get through and we'll test it and see how well it works. And I bet you it's probably going to work pretty well. Um, but I have no way to know, you know, just until the cable arrives. So we'll see. Next up, we have the USB-A ports. We have two of them. Uh, they are labeled on the device USB-A 5 volt 3 amp times 2. Uh, they are in, labeled in the manual as USB-A quick charge ports, which is different and better, by the way. And they test out on my tester as USB quick charge ports. So these are actually quick charge ports, despite what it says in the front of the device. Um, and here it is. I'm testing one of them at 9 volts and one of them at 12 volts. And we're pulling, you know, the amount of power that you can get out of a quick charge port, which isn't that much, but it's 18 watts. So that works. Uh, I have no idea why the test device is labeled USB-A 5 volt 3 amp when it's actually a quick charge port. Maybe some kind of a change. Um, and hopefully they will fix this label on the uh, production models to, to demonstrate that they are, in fact, quick charge ports. Next up is the USB-C power delivery ports. There are two of them on the front of the device. Both are marked 100 watts. In the manual and on the sticker on the back of the device, they are marked that you can pull 100 watts from one port or 150 watts from two ports, meaning it's not really two 100 watts ports. It's really 150 watts for both ports. Divide them up between the two. If you hook a meter up to each port, one port at a time, both ports report being 100 watt ports. When the ports are used in conjunction with each other, it does correctly reduce the power available to the second port when the first port is running. Uh, here you can see I'm charging up two batteries at the same time, and it's reporting charging at 183 watts, which is actually a little bit faster than the 150 watt rated maximum, and it is not overloading or throwing any errors. Uh, this section of the video here is why the video is marked updated. Originally there was a problem here where the unit would actually overload if you tried to pull more than 150 watts from it because it wasn't reporting the power usage of the first device to the second device. Bluetti has fixed this problem in a firmware update, which came out, of course, Murphy's Law, two days after the video comes out. So, if you have an AC200L and haven't run the firmware update yet, please run the firmware update. It fixes the problem. Additionally, if you buy an AC200L and you haven't bought one yet, uh, this problem is going to wind up being fixed from Bluetti because they're going to be shipping the new firmware in the device before you even get it. But same thing applies, you know, run the firmware update as soon as you get it. It didn't make any sense to me to keep the previous version of the video up where I was complaining about a USB power delivery problem where the power delivery problem has been fixed. Uh, I think that would just confuse people. Also, I do want to call out Bluetti did not contact me to ask me to update the video, nor would they, nor did they demand that I updated the video, and if they did do those things, I wouldn't agree to go along with it. I'm updating it myself simply because I don't want people to be confused about a problem that's already been fixed. Disturbingly missing from the top of the device is any sort of wireless charging pad. Uh, AC200P and AC200 Max and AC180 and a number of other Bluetti devices come stock standard with a wireless charging pad on the top of the device. Uh, in fact, the bigger the devices uh, tended to have two of them. Uh, Bluetti has chosen, for a reason that is beyond me, to remove this port, uh, which is actually really kind of annoying because I use it all the time. Um, this is really a flagship device and it doesn't make sense to cheap out and remove ports off the top of the device on a flagship device. It just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I don't understand it, and I'm really hoping this trend does not continue. Uh, but I will call out there are no wireless charging pads on the top of this device, so if you're going to wirelessly charge your phone, you're going to have to buy a wireless charger and plug it into the front. AC and DC efficiency testing, as you guys know, 
I tend to take a lot of time to do very detailed AC and DC efficiency testing simply because efficiency is not a constant across loads. If you put different loads on it, you're going to get different efficiency numbers. So a single measurement is not enough. Uh, the downside of this method is it takes a while, uh, which is why my video is out quite a bit later than other videos because just the testing took a certain number of hours. Uh, in this particular case it took uh, 652 hours and 19 minutes of discharge testing. Uh, that's simply all the numbers on the graph you're going to see in a minute added up. Uh, that number does not include uh, recharge time uh, and it does not include the amount of time it took to generate all the charging graphs. That's separate. Uh, we're going to be comparing that to the AC200 Max and the AC180. That's one unit smaller and one unit older. Uh, for a total of 1,583 hours of discharge testing being reviewed in today's video. So, now the meat. Discharge efficiency of the AC 200L at room temperature. Uh, AC and DC numbers. So, uh, we've got DC being more efficient than AC up until about 150 watts. Um, which is normal. Uh, the inverter actually costs power to keep it running. So if you don't have enough load on it, you're going to wind up spending more power just to keep the inverter running than you're going to be providing to your load. Uh, above about, what is it, 300-ish uh, watts, we get really darn close to 90%. 90% uh, is the maximum you will ever see on a Bluetti device because they hold 10% of the battery in reserve, meaning that they will not give you that 10%. That's to prevent the battery from actually going to zero. Uh, if the battery actually gets to zero, it's really, really hard to recover the device because, for safety reasons, the BMS itself has to run off the battery. And if the battery's at zero, the battery controller running off the battery, uh, it's not an easy way to recover it. It's possible, it's just a pain. So to try to prevent that from happening, they hold that last 10% of the battery in reserve, so you're never going to see more than 90%. So this is uh, darn near perfect until we get above, say, 1200 watts, where cooling starts to become a factor, the fans kick on and the efficiency starts to go down a little bit. Of course, efficiency in standalone doesn't tell us anything. We have to compare it to things. So let's compare it to the AC180 and the AC200 Max on the same graph. And this is the AC side only. So this gives us both the efficiency numbers um, and not only the efficiency numbers, but the run times. So if you've got a uh, you know, 100 watt device and you want to run it either off the AC180 or the AC200L, and you're not sure which one you want, well, you can see that on an AC180 it would run for 8 hours and 56 minutes, and on an AC200L it would run for 16 hours and 52 minutes. So basically double the runtime, which is cool because it's double the battery size. So, you know, that kind of does actually work. Um, and the lines end at different places because the inverters are different size. So you're not going to get 2,400 watts out of a uh, AC180 that the inverter is not that big. Uh, you'll also notice my AC200 max numbers end at 2,000 watts, not 2,200, because the cooling on the AC200 max has very, very difficulty keeping up at 2,200 watts. So AC200L had no trouble at all running at full, ma full max rated power. So yeah, very, very much improved there. Let's look at DC. Somewhat unsurprisingly, the smaller unit got a better score. Uh, this tends to be the case where smaller units that don't need as much circuitry in the BMS, uh, because there's less battery cells, you know, the, the amount of circuitry in the BMS is, is related to the number of battery cells in the unit. So the more battery cells you put in it, the more complex your BMS has to be. So it tends to use more power when you add more battery cells. So not too surprising the AC180 is more efficient on DC than it is the AC200L or the AC200 Max. The other thing I want to call out here, I don't have the cable to test the 48 volt output. So this is testing the DC side, uh, as you see on the screen here, and it's testing the USB side. Um, and I use DC first to get up to 100 watts, and then the numbers above 100 watts I added in the USB-C ports to get me up to 250 watts. Um, I can't get 300 watts because the two USB-C ports both aren't 100 watts. It's 150 watts for both of them. So uh, the DC side itself is actually bigger than what I've been able to measure because you should be able to get another, what, 380 something watts out of the uh, 48 volt port, just I don't have the cable for it. So these numbers will be augmented later on when those cables are available. Next, standby power. So how I measure this is I charge the device fully, 
I put an extremely small load on it so that my load tester will uh, be able to actually measure the time properly. And then I calculate the amount of power that wasn't given to the load must have been used internally, and I also take into account that 10% reserve that Bluetti holds aside. And that gives me how much power the device uses on average. Now, I don't use a 10% drain or a 5% drain or anything like that. I use a full drain because the battery meter itself isn't a constant. In other words, the amount of power between 0% and 1% on the meter, if you were to measure watt hours, is actually about the same on the meter as between 90% and 100%. So that last 1% is 10% of the entire runtime. So. Uh, yeah, you can't simply say, oh, I went from 94% to 92% and therefore extrapolate to the whole device because the meter is not linear. So that doesn't work. You've got to do a full drain or your numbers just get all kinds of wonky. So comparing this to other things, um, AC200L is about three quarters of the way down the chart. And on the AC side, we're at nine watts, which is what? AC200 max is 16 watts. So drastically better power, power usage. In fact, nine watts is about the same as an EB70S. For internal power usage. Uh, very, very similar to AC70, which, yes, I do have measurements for AC70. No, the video is not out yet because I'm not completely done with it, but you guys can take a look at it. On the DC side, we're looking at 6 watts internal power usage, which is down from the AC200 max at 7.75, but not significantly down. Um, the, the clear winner there is still the B80 battery at less than a watt, um, but yeah, the B80 battery doesn't have an inverter in it, so uh, there's, there's, it doesn't have Bluetooth, it doesn't have a screen, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that it doesn't have, which is why they can get the power usage so low. So they've been working really, really hard on getting this standby power down. Um, one of the big complaints in the AC200P days was how much uh, power the, the device used internally. And with AC200L, I'm, I'm happy to say that mostly they fixed the issue. I mean, it's not zero, but it's a lot lower. So very good there. Let's take a closer look at the new screen on the AC200L. So first off, to see what we're comparing it to, let's take a quick rehash of the screen on the AC200 Max. The AC200 Max has a resistive touch screen where you can touch various portions of the screen to navigate through the menus, change settings, and you can tap on the battery to see more information about which battery pack is available. Uh, turn the DC on, turn the AC on, and you can see all the errors. Uh, the downside, the upside, of course, being that you can touch the screen and get a lot of control over the device. Uh, the downside being this is a old-style uh, resistive touchscreen, uh, which means that I really don't want to put too much pressure on it. Um, if you push, even just pushing too hard uh, can distort the screen and potentially damage it. I've actually gotten in the habit of when I pick the AC200 Max up and carry it around, I carry it around such that the screen is on away from my body so that I don't accidentally bang it on things. So the screen itself is fragile and the screen has been a source of issues. Uh, people have had failed screens. Uh, people have had screens where, uh, you know, the screen is inverted. It's upside down because it's not hooked up right. Uh, there's been all kinds of issues with this screen. Uh, but overall, it's it's been a relatively nice experience for the screen because you can go up to the device and actually use it directly on the device. Now, switching over to AC200L, we have a screen that does not have any touch capability. Touching the screen doesn't do anything. Uh, the screen itself, it's a much simpler screen. Um, it's much brighter, as you can see. Uh, it's easy to see outdoors. The AC200 Max had trouble with that. So, as far as working as a screen, um, <laughs> the AC200L works better under, under direct sunlight. Uh, however, it, it's a much simpler device. Um, this is just an LED panel, LCD panel, excuse me, color LCD, um, with icons on it. You can see here I've got a, a Bluetooth icon, I've got a Wi-Fi icon, because there is Wi-Fi in the unit. We'll talk about the app in a few minutes. Um, we've got an icon for when the batteries are connected or disconnected, so we can tell that. We've got a DC input, DC output. AC input, AC output, and then a indicator of the overall battery health, which, by the way, does update when you uh, connect an external battery to it. Uh, and it's got a guess of how long it's going to run, which uh, wasn't didn't exist on the AC200 Max. 
But as far as changing the settings, that's a little bit more complicated on the AC200L if you don't want to use the app. What you have to do is hit the AC and DC buttons both at the same time. Hold it down for a second. That gets you into the settings mode. Where I now have to go find the manual to try to remember what P01 means. Um, in this case, they do give us a hint. Uh, the, the 60 hertz thing is flashing, uh, which lets us change it to, if I press AC, I can set it to 50 hertz, which I don't want to do any time in the US. Uh, to move to the next setting, I hit DC again. It gives me uh, P03, which again, I'd have to go figure out what P03 does in the manual. I have no idea what happened to P02, by the way. It's not there, I guess. Uh, but that seems to have the uh, charging modes flashing. So if I hit the button, it seems to turn on silent mode. It seems to turn on uh, quick charging mode, turbo mode. Or sets it back to uh, standard mode. Uh, P04, I get the power lifting icon flashing. So I can turn that on. I'll turn it off. Off is better. Uh, P05, I get eco mode. I can turn that on or off. Uh, not entirely sure how to control the AC eco versus the DC eco options that are in the app from the front of the device. I guess you just can't. Not sure on that one. Uh, P06, the Bluetooth icon flashes on and off. You could turn that off if you want to. P07, the Wi-Fi icon flashes on and off. Uh, you could turn that off if you want to, and then it goes back to P01. Uh, and that appears to be all the settings you can set on the front of the device. Um, as far as I can tell, there is not any way to set the UPS mode features uh, or the uh, current limiter uh, for the charging rates uh, or any of the other uh, many settings uh, without using the app. Uh, so that is kind of a negative of this new screen technology. But the, the advantage here really, and really when I think about what I want a screen to do, I want to be able to go outside and see the screen. The AC200 Max, the screen was too dim. You couldn't do that. And the AC200L, I want to bring it in the camper and not have to worry about banging it around a little bit. And with the AC200 Max, I had to be really, really careful with the screen. So despite this kind of negative experience that I'm showing you with changing settings without using the app, I do think the screen is an improvement over the old screen because it works better as a screen. All right, we're gonna test the grounding on the AC200L and make sure all the ground ports are all connected together. They should be. You should only have one ground on a circuit, not multiple, that would be bad. So I have my uh, probes here and my multimeter. My multimeter is set in what's called continuity mode, which means if I touch the two pins together, it beeps. So we'll know it's connected when it beeps. First thing I got to test is the AC power plug, which by the way is plugged in right now. I need to make sure that the ground pin on the AC power plug right there is connected to the grounding lug on the side of the device. It should be up here. There we go. That's connected. Very good. So now that I know the power plug is connected to the ground lug, we'll do all the rest of the testing from the ground lug. Next, we're going to test the AC outlets. Turn the inverter off here. Test one. Test the second one. Good. Third one. Good. Fourth one. Good. And the, uh, the ground lug on the TT30, by the way, is this top one. And that's connected correctly. Now we'll do the same thing with the inverter turned on. Still connected. Good. 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 And good. Okay, so everything's working as expected with the uh, AC inverter on and off. Let's plug it into power here, and it'll start charging in a moment here. And now we've got grid power coming in, and I should still have the ground lug connected to the outputs here. Good. 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 Very nice. Yeah, everything on the AC side is all grounded up correctly. Next is the AC charging test. How fast can we get it to charge from an AC wall outlet? So when it comes out of the box, you may notice that there are three settings. We have a standard mode, we have a turbo mode, and we have a silent mode. But also, if you poke in the app a little further and go into the advanced menu, you will find that there is a max current setting, max charging current of grid that can be set anywhere between 
uh, 1 amp through 12 amps by default. And if you go into Pro Mode, uh, which you'll have to contact Blue Eddy to get a password for, uh, you can actually set it up to 20 amps. So uh, what is Pro Mode about? Why do you need, need a password? Well, th uh, this cable that comes from the device, uh, th th this one can't handle 20 amps. Uh, you'll break your circuit breaker is what will actually happen. Um, uh, you'll blow the breaker uh, because a U.S. house outlet is not spec'd for 20 amps. So you'll need a bigger cable to be able to use that. That's why they stuck it behind a password to prevent people from just blowing their circuit breakers. Uh, 12 amps is the default and 12 amps should be the default. Um, the standard U.S. outlet's a 15 amp, uh, amp outlet. You can pull a maximum of 80% from a U.S. outlet over the long term and 80% of 15 is 12. So 12 amps is what you want by default. If you happen to have a 20 amp outlet, which looks like this, uh, then you can go ahead and set it up to 15 with the stock cable. No problem there. But don't plug it into a 15 amp outlet when it's set to 15, unless you want to blow the circuit breaker about five minutes later. So um, straight out of the box here, let's uh, turn it on, turn on the outlet here and see what we charge at. Okay, it finds some power. And it starts charging at about 1200 watts. Uh, that's on standard mode. Uh, if I set this to uh, turbo mode, it goes faster. Um, it goes up to uh, 1400 watts, which is right about 12 amps. So it's actually at the amp limiter at this moment. And if I set it down to silent mode, uh, now it's down to 800 watts. So the, the three modes do work. Um, but one of the questions that I had is how do these three modes work as you change the amp limiter? Because it's got both the three modes and an amp limiter and they both are turned on at the same time. What do these things do in combination with each other? Let's take a look at that. If we look first off at silent mode, um, I have done uh, six different discharge and charge tests for this. And we've done 4 amp, 8 amp, 10 amp, 12 amp, 15 amp, and 20 amp uh, from 0% to 100% and measured out the charging rate of time once every minute over the amount of time it takes to finish charging and then marked down how long it takes. So that's the experiment here. Uh, you'll notice that uh, none of the modes above 10 amps do anything. Uh, when I set it to 10 amps, I get 250, 2 hours and 59 minutes, excuse me. Uh, when I set it to 12 amps, I get 2 hours and 59 minutes. When I set it to 15 amps, I get 2 hours and 58 minutes. So really, silent mode wants to charge at a rate um, a little bit over 750 watts from the wall. Uh, and that's the rate it wants to charge at. Um, and if you set the amp limiter higher, it's not going to go any faster. Uh, standard mode. It wants to charge at about a little over 1250 watts. But if you set the amp limiter lower, it will charge slower. So at 20 amps, it takes 2 hours and 2 minutes. At 15 amps, it takes 2 hours and 2 minutes, exactly the same. At 12 amps, it takes 2 hours and 11 minutes. Uh, just a tiny little bit of difference there, probably heat or something. Uh, 10 amps took 2 hours and 5 minutes, so here we're pretty much all the same. Uh, at 8 amps, it took 3 hours and 22 minutes. And at 4 amps, it took 5 hours and 16 minutes. So you can limit it, but it does have a speed it wants to go at. Now, turbo mode's a little different. Uh, in turbo mode, it's going to want to go as fast as you set that amp limit. So in turbo mode at 4 amps, it's going to charge at 4 amps and take 5 hours. At 8 amps, it's going to charge at 8 amps and takes 2 hours and 34 minutes. At 10 amps, it's going to charge at 10 amps and takes 2 hours and 7 minutes. All the way up to 20 amps, where you can get it to charge from dead to full in an hour and 10 minutes. And by the way, they do say in the manual that turbo mode is not as good for the battery. But be aware that turbo mode, when the amp limiter is not set at full amperage, is not actually going as fast as it can go. Um, I don't see any issue using turbo mode uh, down at the 8 to 10 amp range. Because turbo mode and standard mode at 10 amps is actually exactly the same thing. There's a graph of that.
AC200L solar DC charging test. So what I have here as my experimental setup, I have a big DC power supply. Uh, this is a 12 volt, 245 volt, 33 amp, 5 kilowatt power supply. The AC200L is rated for 1200 watts of charging with an input range of 12 to 145 volts at 15 amps. Uh, in other words, the voltage on the power supply can go higher and lower than is needed by the AC200L, and it can provide more amps than AC200L needs. So this power supply can fully test the limits of this thing's solar charger, which is a good thing. So let's, uh, oh, by the way, this is a DC circuit breaker, so I can turn on and off the power. You'll see why in a minute. Um, let's get up to where it starts pulling power. That's going to be about right there. 10.6, 10.5. Now we're only pulling half an amp, but we are pulling power at 10.5 volts, which means if you're going to charge this off a lead acid battery, um, be very, very careful because it's going to pull your lead acid battery all the way down to 10.5 volts and completely destroy the battery. You're going to want to put a low voltage cutoff on your 12 volt battery to make sure if you're going to charge this from a 12 volt lead acid battery, that it doesn't over deplete the battery. And notice, by the way, it's it's showing zero watts on the screen, but it is pulling power from the power supply. Let's move up to about 13.8 uh, volts. That's a running car. So it's still a car battery, but now the car's turned on. Now we're pulling 8.2 amps or about 100 watts. Uh, we've got a uh, 2,048 watt hour battery at 100 watts. You're looking 20 plus hours to recharge. And by the way, the car has to be running to get you that amount of voltage. So you'll have to leave your engine running for 20 plus hours. That's not really practical, but you can put some additional charge on it. Uh, there are ways, by the way, to fast charge it off a vehicle, but that involves modifying the vehicle. And that is a different video. Let's move the voltage up to about 19 volts. That will be your standard panel voltage go single panel standard voltage notice we are still at 8.2 amps right here we haven't gone any higher why haven't we gone higher because there's 24 volt cars and 24 volt cars have 24 volt cigarette lighter ports which means that if we switch to start starting to pull the full 15 amps at this point um we would if you plugged it into a car and it can't tell what's plugged into it would melt the cigarette lighter port so that would be bad so because 24 volt cars exist it's only going to charge at 8 amps off a single panel. And even Bluetti's panels, which have a little bit higher voltage, let's go up to 22 volts. This is more where like a PV200 panel is at. And we're getting, what, 169 watts over here. Uh, and But we're still only pulling 8.2 amps. And why are we doing that? Again, 24 volt cars exist. So if you want to pull the full 15 amps, you're going to need to have more than one panel. It'll charge off one panel. Uh, it'll take multiple days to do it at 169 watts, uh, but it, it will, uh, it'll take multiple days to charge off one panel. So multiple panels is better. Voltage going up. Let's get about a little bit above 30 volts. Uh, 35 is probably good. And you'll see we're still at 8.2 amps. Um, there's a bug in the review units that it doesn't automatically switch to the higher current but when you sweep upwards, which is why I have this DC circuit breaker here. So if I turn the breaker off and I turn the breaker back on, it's going to automatically switch up. Uh, they tell me this is fixed in the production models. Um, I have no way to, uh, to confirm that because at this point I don't have a production model. Uh, but uh, it is what it is on the, uh, on the review unit. So at uh, 35 volts, we're all the way up at 510 watts of charging, which is a good thing. But if you're going to be using a 200 watt panel, most of the 200 watt panels on the market are 10 amp panels. Notice I'm pulling 15 amps. So how do I get 15 amps out of 10 amp panels? Well, you put two sets of them in parallel. So you're looking at a series parallel setup similar to what's required for the AC300 and the AC500 in order to max out the solar input. So let's keep going up in voltage. Get up to about 50 volts. That's going to be your big residential panels for a single one. There we go. We're still pulling 15 amps and we're at 700 watts. Most of your big residential panels that are about 50 volts are about 500 watt panels these days. And we can actually pull more than 500 watts at that voltage. So you can max out one of those panels. Very nice. Let's keep going up. 
figure out where the maximum is. It is rated for 1200 watts. Let's see how much voltage it takes to get to 1200 watts. Almost there. 1189, 1195. There we go. So, right about 80-ish 80 80 -ish volts is where my current starts going down. The point when the current starts going down is where you don't need any more additional voltage in order to max out the device. So, if you want a low voltage array, in other words, uh, you want to be able to have an array built such that you can deal with snow and ice when it gets cold, where your panels make more voltage because it's gotten cold outside. You don't want to have too high of a voltage. You instead want to have a current-heavy array. Your target area is going to be, I would say, about 85 volts on this unit. Uh, yeah, you can go up to 150 volts, but as long as you have 15 amps, there's no point. It, it won't go any faster, you'll see. Bump it up to the max here. See, my current is slowly going down as my voltage is going up. And I am pegged at the max charging rate, 1196 watts. And as my voltage goes up, the charging rate is not going any faster. Now, let's say you have 10 amp panels. Go back down a little bit. Let's say you have 10 amp panels. If I have 10 amp panels, I want to set my voltage to around 123 volts because I can still hit the maximum. I'm at 1193 watts. I can still hit the max charge rate, but now I don't need to do series parallel if I get my panel voltage up to about 123 volts. That being said, I now have less overhead if things get into a freezing condition where my panels are making extra voltage. I got to keep it below that maximum, but there is a way to hook it up with 10 amp panels too. So let's keep going up. 140. Okay, we're right near the max here. And as soon as we get above, drops to zero. So the device is going to protect itself and throw an error. We see we've got the DC side blinking and we've got some errors on the screen. A little PV icon here is flashing. And that's telling us that it's unhappy. And it's unhappy because the voltage is too high. When we reduce the voltage back down, see my current comes back up, it automatically restarts charging. So that's a good thing. Uh, but don't put it into an overvoltage situation on purpose. Uh, it's bad for it. <laughs> I mean, I do one while I'm testing, but I, I don't build a solar array that on purpose overvolts the device. All right, the maximum charge rate or dual charging test. Will it go any faster if I give it both solar and AC at the same time? So here I have it hooked up. It's in turbo mode at 20 amps. We're charging at 2,380 watts from AC. I have my big DC power supply, 63 volts with uh, no amps coming out of it. This is a, uh, a power switch, basically. It's a, uh, so I can turn it on and off. And let's connect this up. Let's have it find solar, and does it go faster than 2300 watts? And not really. <laughs> so you can see it's picked up some DC input, 900 watts, and it's reduced our AC input down to 1400 watts. So add these together, you get about 2300 watts. So 2300 watts, 2400 watts, that's about as fast as it's gonna go but it's going to prefer solar. You can see it's maxed out the current on the solar at 15.4 amps. That's as much as it's rated for. And it's reduced the amount of AC input. So dual charging it uh, will save you power um, because solar energy, once you've paid for the solar panels, uh, the solar energy itself is free. So it, it'll reduce your electric bill for sure to charge it off solar, but it's not going to make it go any faster than it otherwise would normally go. Okay, let's take a look at Blue Eddy's app for the AC200L. Um, going back in history, AC200P didn't have app control at all. You could only use the screen. AC200 Max has app control, but only by Bluetooth. AC200L has what they call the cloud connection and also Bluetooth. 
The cloud connection, how that works, is both your device and your phone make outgoing connections to Blue Eddy's server. The server relays the commands between the AC200L and your device, your phone, and thusly allows you to control the device remotely from wherever you are as long as both the AC200L and your phone have internet connection and as long as the Blue Eddy server is up and running. So if we're going to fire up the app, we'll go to My Devices. I'm going to tap on the little circle. I'm going to hit Bluetooth to force a local connection because the uh, firmware update menu doesn't show up um, when you're on the cloud menu. They want you physically standing there next to it if you're going to update it. So we've got the main screen. Uh, so first off, uh, we've got the uh, five icons, the PV, the grid, the DC, USB, and the AC. So I'm going to put some PV power into it, simulated PV power, but anyway, so we can see what that does. Tap on the PV icon. And it's going to give us power and voltage. And you can see right now I'm feeding about 90 volts into it, so it's charging at 1100 watts. And if I turn my solar off, in the app, within a second or so, the power goes to zero, and it uh, stops charging. So it's actually reading out what it's really getting in. Grid, same thing. I can tap on grid. I get power and voltage. If I turn on the power strip that it's plugged into, see my uh, voltage goes from zero up to 120 volts and it's going to start charging. And let's turn that back off. Next, I can tap on the DC USB icon, which does nothing. I can tap on the AC output icon, which I should probably turn the AC output on before I do that. Turn on the AC output, there we go. Tap on that AC output icon, and it tells me that I'm currently pulling 133 watts, 130 watts, from the AC output, because I do have a device plugged into it. Turn that back off. Uh, one more thing to call out here, uh, DC USB. Notice I have DC slash USB in the app. Uh, notice on the front of the device I have a DC button, and I have a USB button, I have two different buttons. But when I turn it on in the app, it's going to turn both on together. Uh, the app doesn't have a separate control for the DC button versus the USB button. And additionally, notice in the app what happens when I turn off the USB light. The app still shows DC slash USB as being on. So if you turn the switch off in the app, which I'll do right now, it's going to turn off both buttons. If I turn the switch on in the app, it's going to turn on both buttons. So just the thing in case you only use one of the two or both or you are going to routinely turn on or off uh, via the app. Uh, so what else do we have in here? If I tap on the battery percentage in the very center of the app, that's going to give me a drop down and let me take a look at the pack, um, each battery pack that's plugged into the AC200L. AC200L supports, similar to AC200 Max, two external battery packs, um, up to two. And it's going to give you the, uh, the make, model, serial number, state of charge, and whether or not it's connected, in other words, in parallel, whether or not it's connected, and fault codes for each one of the batteries. And that's how you get to that. And right now I don't have that plugged in, so there's nothing there. Uh, if I tap the little gear in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, we can see the user manuals, we can see the network settings, uh, we can set the default mode, that's if you don't use the little uh, circle with three buttons, that's if you just tap on it, is it going to try to connect by cloud or by Bluetooth by default. Uh, home page display, the main page of the app can show one and only one of your devices. You get to pick which one you want. Uh, working mode, so we have standard UPS, PV priority UPS, time control UPS, and customized UPS. I'm going to make these a separate video uh, because I really want to go into the details of how each one of these modes works. So that's going to be maybe about another week from now. There's going to be a video very specifically on these modes and we will go into detail on exactly what each one of these things does. But for now we're not going to do that. Okay. Charging mode, we've got uh, standard silent and turbo. We covered that in the AC stuff. Grid self-adaption. Uh, uh, this does two things. Um, prior to this model, by the way, it only did one thing, but starting with this model, it does two things. Uh, one, it 
allows the device to charge off of less stable power. Now, less stable, what does that mean? Um, let's say your frequency is a little bit out of whack. You're running a generator and it's not quite giving you 60 hertz, it's giving you 63 hertz. Well, um, most bloody devices are simply going to refuse to charge. Uh, in this case, try turning on grid self-adaption. It might let you charge, maybe. Uh, probably won't if your generator is real bad, but it might let you charge. Uh, the other thing that it does is it sets the, the online offline UPS in the system. Uh, your uninterruptible power supply in the system is going to be optimized now for brownouts instead of for blackouts. Uh, meaning that it might take a little bit longer to switch over, but it will also wait a little bit to switch over so that it's not switching over and then switching back and then switching over and then switching back quite so often. So if you're in an area where you have frequent brownouts, but you don't have frequent blackouts, this is the mode you're going to want to turn on. Uh, power lifting mode. Uh, what power lifting mode does is it, it decreases the voltage of the system to allow more amperage to be pulled out of the system. Uh, this is really only useful in very rare cases, uh, such as if you're running a purely resistive device like a, a toaster. Um, and in fact, not even all toasters anymore. Some toasters have microprocessors in them now. Um, a hair dryer, maybe, and not even all hair dryers. Some hair dryers have microcontrollers in them. So it, it really depends on what exactly you're doing with it. Um, power lifting, because it's reducing the voltage, it's going to damage any device that has a DC power supply in it. In other words, anything that has a microcontroller. If your toaster has a little cancel button on the front with, le with an LED next to it, and you plug your toaster into power lifting mode, you're going to potentially damage the toaster. If you have a ye old analog toaster from the 70s that doesn't have microcontrollers in it, and it wants to pull more power than the AC200L can give, then power lifting might help. Um, but, but in general, never turn on power lifting mode if you're running anything with a, with a microprocessor, anything with a motor, or anything with a compressor. Always leave it off with those devices or you're going to damage your device. In other words, on a device as big as the AC200L, always leave it off and left you, unless you need it, okay? Not something you want turned on. Uh, eco mode. There's an AC eco and a DC eco. Turn on both of those so we can see the various options. Uh, this will automatically turn the outputs back off after a set number of hours of drawing less than a set number of watts. What's the use case here? Well, I'm camping. It's the middle of the night. The only thing I want to do is charge my phone. I don't necessarily want to have anything else running. I just want to charge my phone. Well, my, my phone's not going to take eight hours to charge. It's going to take like two hours. So I can take the DC Eco, turn it on, set it to five watts, it's fine, and set the shutdown to one hour. Then one hour after my phone is done charging, it'll turn the DC mode back off. Very helpful mode. AC, same idea, a little bit less useful on the AC side, but let's say you want it to automatically turn off the inverter after a certain number of hours. You can do that too. Okay. Turn that function back off and get back out of there. Uh, auto sleep, that sets how long it takes for the screen to turn off. Uh, notice, interestingly, this has nothing to do with actually turning the device off. This doesn't set the auto sleep of the device. This sets the auto sleep of the screen. Uh, there isn't any way to configure the auto sleep of the device. Uh, it's going to turn off on its own when it wants to. Uh, DC input source, there are three here. Uh, we have the PV and other mode. That's from the AC200 Max. PV, of course, is solar panels. And other is either when you're running it from a car or you're running it from an external battery. Uh, or there's the new one, self-adaptive, which it tries to figure out what it's running from and uh, makes, <laughs> makes an attempt anyway at uh, selecting the correct mode. Now, on the review unit... Uh, the self-adaptive mode uh, does not work. Uh, it should work on the, uh, the production models. Uh, but I couldn't actually get that to do anything. I did report it to Blue Eddy, and they're trying to figure it out. Uh, but it should, in theory anyway, uh, make an attempt to auto-select between PV and other. So that's, that's the goal of what that's for. Uh, I can't show you it working just because it doesn't seem to do anything on my device. Uh, let's go into our advanced uh, we have the AC output frequency, set that 60 to 50. Uh, the US is 60 hertz, 
So if you're running US devices, you want it set to 60 hertz. Um, if you're in Japan, you're running Japanese stuff, you're going to want 50 hertz. Uh, max current charging of grid currently set to 20 amps. So if I tap on that, um, you can set your current. So I tap on there, it says 1 to 12. Well, how did I get this set to 20? So let me turn it down to 12, which is the default. Down below that is what's called Pro Mode. If I go to turn that on, it's going to ask for a password. You have to get that password from Bluetti. No, unfortunately, I don't get to tell you what it is. Um, the reason you need a password is because if you charge at 20 amps through the stock cable, you will blow a circuit breaker in your house because you're going to be pulling too much power through the outlet. So they want to make sure that you are set up with the proper cable before they're going to let unlock the mode. They don't charge anything for it. There's no fees for unlocking it. Uh, there's no, I've seen at least one other company wanted a subscription for unlocking it. That's kind of crazy. Um, no, you just you send them an email or give them a call. They have both telephone and email support. And uh, they're, they're going to ask you, do you have the better cable? And if you say yes, they'll give you the password. That's all there is to it. Uh, there's also a factory reset button, which resets all the settings of the entire device um, back to what the factory had in case you uh, go in there and change the, uh, the working mode here with all the different options and you change that to something uh, very confusing, uh, you can go back in there and do a factory reset to, to undo whatever it is you wind up doing. And that's basically the app. Um, very similar to other Blue Eddy devices. Um, it does have a couple more options. This is the first one that has the, uh, the current setting that we covered in the uh, AC charging mode section. Uh, of this size class. Uh, the AC300 and AC500 have had this for a while, um, but of course you can't set it in the app on those. You have to walk up to the device to change it. Uh, but, but it's very helpful to have in this size of device because if you want to charge it off a smaller generator or a, a smaller inverter, let's say you have a 1000 watt inverter, you can actually go in there and set it to uh, 8 amps, uh, which will be right about your 1000 watt inverter. And it'll, uh, it'll run fine off that inverter. So very, very helpful modes to have. Uh, last little bit on the app, if we scroll down to the bottom here, we see the PV generation and CO2 reduction area. PV generation, that is a lifetime counter of how much it's made in the lifetime of the device. Um, not, not like per week, per month, that's, that's per life. And CO2 reduction simply multiplies the, uh, the PV reduction by a number that you set in the settings. You can make that whatever you want. You can also turn it off, of course. Hit the power button. I'm going to press OK. And it's going to turn itself off. And when it does turn off, um, like other Blue Eddy devices, off means off, which means now the radio in the device that would normally connect to Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, that radio is now turned off, meaning I can't use the app to turn it back on. So if I hit the power button here, it's just going to give me communication disconnected. Uh, well, why is it disconnected? Because it's off. So that's not going to work so well. You guys saw in the video teaser that there is a new way to control the AC200L, um, and that's via an Amazon Alexa integration. So let's go ahead and bring that up. I have the Alexa app installed on a phone here. I'm going to tap on that to open the app itself. And it's telling me that it has four new devices connected via the uh, Bluetti Voice Assistant skill. So the way you find this is you go into your Alexa app and you're going to go under devices and you can go down to the bottom. So you see how it says your smart home skills. You're going to tap on that and you're going to find tap on enable smart home skills, search for the Blue Eddy voice assistant and install it. And it will tell you what it can do. Um, it can turn on. Uh, my power, by the way, is the name of your device. So turn on AC 200 L and you can either say direct current or alternating current, a bit of a longer way of saying AC or DC, but the same thing. And you can tell it to turn the devices on or off. Uh, the other thing you can do is I'm going to go back to the home screen and via Alexa, I can actually tap on AC 200 L and I can see the SOC of the device, which interestingly appears as a slider. You can't actually change the SOC by sliding it back and forth. That would be pretty funny if you could, but you can't. Uh, and you can uh, see the direct current DC side is off or on, and I can turn it on either by the button here. I can turn on direct current. That turns on them both and turn them back off. Or I can use a voice command. 
Alexa, turn on AC200L, direct current. Okay. And that turns it back on. So this works for uh, any device that connects via Wi-Fi from Blue Eddy. So not just the AC200L. They have enabled this on all the other Wi-Fi devices. So uh, AC300, AC500, um, EP500 series, all of those. This all works too. But this, is, this happens to come out at the same time as the AC200L, so it makes sense to cover it in this video. AC maximum load test. So what I have here is my experimental setup is three horribly crappy AC-powered electric heaters. Uh, they're desktop size heaters. They're not very big. They have uh, no uh, microprocessor-based control circuitry in them. And they get kind of hot. Um, they use up about a thousand watts each. So I've got three of them here to make sure I can go over the max. Uh, one of the three of them I am running off of an old school dimmer switch so I can turn the heater up and down uh, gradually. Well, it's a good way to do it. Uh, now, of course, this dimmer switch would completely destroy the heater uh, if it was uh, a digital device, but these are purely analog devices, so there's no, no issue with that there. So uh, let's go ahead and get this test started. Okay, now we're cruising along at around uh, 1,900 watts out of our 2,400 watt rated inverter. And before we get into the maximum, let me just show you what the power quality looks like right now. This meter right here is measuring the total harmonic distortion, also known as the percentage of the power that is not a perfect sine wave. So that's at 1.3%. So that's actually really, really good, considering that my utility power, Pacific Glass and Electric, I live near San Francisco and PG&E is our utility, uh, they routinely give me 7.2-ish as my uh, total harmonic distortion. So uh, very, very, very good reading here. Um, very clean power, uh, considering the amount of load I'm pulling. Let's uh, start up, upping the amount of power here. Thousand watts. This is a 2400 watt rated machine. So let's get it up to 2400 watts. There we go, a little bit beyond. 2500, let's see where it stops. 27. 3000 watts. 3100 watts. Wow, that was actually really impressive. Um, so this is only rated for 2,400 watts, but I was able to pull uh, 3,100 watts for about two seconds before it cut off. So that means if you have a larger device that's got a startup surge, like say a window air conditioner, like say a big window air conditioner, you know, 10,000 plus BTUs, uh, those are gonna pull very high amperage for a short period of time this inverter appears to have the capacity to keep up with that kind of thing. So if you're worried about startup surges, um, you don't have to worry too much. Next, let's have a quick discussion on power cleanliness while I'm waiting for the uh, fans to warm up the room here. <laughs> um, I, of course, do graph the uh, total harmonic distortion uh, from these devices. And I have a graph up here. We're going to be comparing the AC200L to the AC200 Max, to the AC500, and to the AC180. So a bunch of different devices all in the same graph. Um, you can see, of course, none of these are perfectly straight lines. Why is that? Because what you're using as your load device affects your total harmonic distortion. And given that uh, uh, purely clean laboratory-grade lo AC loads that go up to 2,500 watts are uh, very, very expensive, um, I don't have those, so uh, I have, shall we say, lesser loads. And you wind up with a little bit of a wavy line at the bottom. But the point on this graph is really that regardless of which Blue Eddy device you choose, you're going to wind up with drastically cleaner power than you'd wind up with from your utility. Uh, I could do a test, you know, plug it into something and see if it buzzes or whatnot, but that's, that's not really that great of a test because it doesn't quantify how clean the power is. And that's what really this does. 
This is a measurement of the cleanliness of your power over different loads through the inverter of the device. And everything Blue Eddy makes is drastically cleaner than my utility power. Um, maybe you live in a part of the world where that's not the case, but at least where I'm at, PG&E, the power is, uh, you know, borderline not even within spec. Uh, it's supposed to be 5% or less is the U.S. spec, and uh, I get drastically higher. UPS mode testing. So the AC200L, like many other Blue Eddy devices and many other solar generators these days, has an offline UPS built in. An offline UPS takes the input power coming in from the grid and passes it directly through to the AC outputs. When the power goes out, it has a relay that switches the AC outputs from the input power to the output of the built-in inverter. In other words, it's flipping the power from one power source to the other, and it's flipping it real quick right as the power goes out. So the question is, um, how fast does it switch? The standard for US power is 20 milliseconds, meaning that if your device um, is happily running along um, and the power switches, then as long as the switching takes less than 20 milliseconds, your device should not notice and continue running just fine. So experimental setup for this. I have the AC200L and the uh, little 9 volt device that I'm using as a trigger is both plugged into this power squid thing, and that's plugged into a power switch, so I can turn it on and off. The output of my little 9 volt brick is going into this splitter, which on one side has a load tester hooked up to it, right here. That's to put a little bit of load on the brick, uh, basically to make the uh, power in the brick go down faster. Uh, and the other side of this splitter is going into my oscilloscope. Of course, if you're going to reproduce this test, always use a battery-powered oscilloscope. It's really dangerous to test mains powers if your oscilloscope is also running off mains power. So this battery-powered oscilloscope. The other side of the oscilloscope, I have this plug right here, which is coming out of the power output of the AC200L and going into the scope through an attenuator. Again, always use an attenuator. Oscilloscopes can't take 120 volts AC. It'll blow up the scope. So another safety thing there. And uh, first time this one, uh, for this experiment, this is the first time I'm doing this one, it was suggested by others, I'm putting a load, a uh, fairly significant load, it's going to be about 400 watts, this is an electric heater, and we're going to have that running off the inverter to try to make it take longer to switch. So we're giving it kind of a harsh switch this time. So I'm going to turn everything on. There we go, we've got my load here is running, that's pulling power from the power brick. This is going to start charging. Turn on the AC output. My heater kicks on. I'm going to set the oscilloscope into trigger mode. Push the button here. There we go. Now it should be ready to trigger as soon as I turn the power off. Let's turn the power off and get a good reading. There we go. We've got a reading. Let's take a close look at that reading. This oscilloscope, like many others, has a set of measurement tools built in. So let's hit the measure button, go to cursor, change it to a time cursor. Here we go. Now I've got two lines here, A and B, and we're going to measure the distance from A to B. So let's put A kind of where it started messing up. That right there. That's, that's really... Where's that? Yeah, right there. That little spike right there. That, that looks kind of bad. And then let's go to B, and let's go right there, there we go. Uh, in fact, let's go back even further on A. Let's go back to that little dot. Let's go right there, there we go. Okay, now how long did it actually take to switch? So right here I've got A to B is 13.8 milliseconds. So between this point here and that point there is 13.8 milliseconds. That is way less than 20 milliseconds. So if I had some kind of sensitive device plugged in here and that device follows the US standard for how long it takes to, uh, how long it can handle a power outage, uh, which most everything does follow that standard, um, there would be no problem. So my device would continue to run, no issue there. Um, so it definitely meets the specification. We're gonna try this one more time. But we're going to try this with the grid boosting mode uh, turned on 
to demonstrate that when you set it for brownouts, it can take a little bit longer to switch. All right, I have the same setup as before, except this time the grid self-adaption mode has been turned on. Interestingly found in the app, it actually shows up in there if you connect by Bluetooth, so... Uh, interesting tidbit there if you want to change that setting, connect by Bluetooth, but everything's still set up and uh, we're up and running and let's flip the switch and get a reading. So the grid self-adaption mode is primarily designed to optimize the machine for brownouts, which means it's going to take longer to switch on a blackout, but it avoids a double switch where your devices are guaranteed to lose power in the case where you get a voltage sag that then corrects itself. This looks like we've got a good reading here. Scoot this over a little bit. There we go, that looks good. Let's take a closer look at this. Okay, let's use the same measurement cursor we did before. Go into measure mode. And... Okay, the cursor, set its time. We've got A and B. So my A... Scoot that over right to about there. That's where it starts getting messed up. And my B, to scoot this all the way over to there. So it's much wider than we had before. There we go, A to B. And A to B is 48 milliseconds. So in this particular case, um, it would not have recovered fast enough. That's with grid self-adaption turned on. So if I had a computer plugged into this, if I had something else sensitive, it would have rebooted the machine. I mean, that, that's what would have happened. But why would you want this mode? Why is it interesting? So why do they have a mode that makes it take longer to switch? Um, it'll charge off of worse power. So if you have crappy power, it'll charge off worse power, where with this option off, it will simply refuse to charge. But turning it on defeats the speed of the UPS mode. Hence why it's an option, and also hence why it's turned off by default. But the other really critical thing that it does, and this is for a lot of folks that live in areas um, where there's lots of electrical storms. If you get a voltage sag because an electrical bolt hits a power pole, you know, 25 miles from your house and blows up a transformer, what's going to wind up happening is you'll get a voltage sag. Instead of 120 volts, for a millisecond or two, you'll have 80 volts. And then it'll come back up, and then it'll go back down to 80 volts, and then it'll come back up again. And that double sag would cause it to switch from the mains power to the battery. Then when the voltage comes back up in the mains power, it switches back to the mains power. And then it goes back down again and switches back to the battery again. That double switch takes too long and guarantees that your devices will lose power. So... This does two things. One, it lets you charge off worse power, and two, it handles brownouts better. So if you know you're going to be having one of those two issues, either you have really bad power, or you have brownouts way more often than you have blackouts, turn this mode on, but understand that the downside of this mode is your UPS feature isn't going to be fast enough to keep a computer running. And that's the downside of it. But it is what it is. I mean, it's far better than not having it. It's an option out there for people to play with. Maximum sound level test. Let's see how loud the AC200L is under as much load as we can put on it. First off, the zero point. About 43 decibels when I, it's perfectly silent in the room. And uh, nothing's turned on yet, so let's give it the AC output. Uh, let's give it the DC output. On the USB output, nothing's plugged into that, but let's turn that one on. There we go, now we're some pulling some power. I have moved my load devices, by the way, into the other room. So they shouldn't affect the sound. Perfectly silent. The fan hasn't even turned on yet. Uh, by the way, as purposes of this recording, uh, right before this section, I was recording the max load test. So the device is already warm. So uh, let's solar charge it. Um, I mean, I've got the power adapter sitting right here. Let's plug that in. Give it some power. Uh, 
There we go, now we're pulling uh, 1200 watts. Basically the full solar load. Let's see how loud it is now. So the fan did turn on, but it is whisper, whisper quiet. Oh, and why don't we give it AC power as well, just for good measure. Let's set it to turbo mode at 20 amps. Get as fast as we can make it go. Turbo mode is on. It's set for 20 amps. There we go. And we're pulling. 2200 watts of AC, interestingly, plus 1100 watts of DC, which is more than we measured earlier, and 100 watts of DC output and 2000 watts of AC output. So how can we do this? We checked earlier that we're not going to ever charge faster than 2200 watts. It's using UPS pass-through here. Some of my 2200 watts input is just going straight through to the output. And it's also charging the battery at 1200 watts. That's what we're reading right here. Okay, now, how loud is this? Marginally louder than where we were. Still way quieter than just my regular speaking voice. So yeah, this is a darn quiet machine. Um, Bluetti has advertised this as a 50 decibel machine in their marketing. Um, I honestly didn't believe them uh, until I ran a bunch of tests. And yeah, this thing is, this thing is quiet. Uh, one additional interesting tidbit um, I poked my head around uh, by looking through the vents, which is really hard to get on camera. Uh, they swapped out all the fans with ball bearing fans. Uh, ball bearing fans are much, much, much quieter than sleeve fans. Uh, and they're like four times the price for the fans. So Bloody spent some extra money on the fan just to make sure that this thing's quiet. So there we go. Very quiet machine. All right, this is a video on the AC200L. Why do I have an AC200 Max sitting on the table? Uh, this is really just to show how far along we've come in uh, sound level management for Bluetti devices. So first off, let me uh, give you a baseline with nothing turned on. Forty-four decibels, just as before, and when I am speaking, we're at about sixty decibels. So I'm going to go ahead and turn everything on here, and then we'll take another reading. All right, so we're cruising along here, a um, little bit under two kilowatts. We've got 100 watts coming out of the DC load. We're charging at 900 plus watts from the fake solar. And we've got 450-ish uh, watts coming in from the DC brick. So we were at, um, you know, around 50-ish, a little bit under 50-ish. I think 48 was our maximum from the AC200L. What sound level are we at now? quite a bit louder. And do remember that with uh, decibels, uh, every time you go up one dB is uh, 10 times the sound. So it's actually quite noisy. And I will uh, hold the mic over here for effect. Yeah, uh, the, really one of the biggest differences between the AC200 Max and the AC200L uh, beyond just all the technology uh, you know, no charging brick, uh, faster, faster charging from solar is just the sound level. And there's just, there's no comparison. The, the old one is so much louder. All right. So we have gone through it. 
Now, there's a few things we didn't do. I will call out, we did not test the 48 volt output because I don't have the cables, I can't actually test it. Uh, we did a little bit of looking at it to see how it works, but until those cables are available, there's not much else I can do there. Uh, we did not benchmark the system with the external battery attached uh, with the B230 or the B300 batteries. Um, the Just the timing of that would not have worked for this video. It would have taken me at least another month to do the benchmarking. And uh, yeah, you guys just don't want to wait that long for the video. So that'll come out when it comes out. Um, the big wait there, there's going to be a new battery, the B210 we talked about earlier. Um, we don't have release dates on it. So I have no idea when that'll be available. We'll do a video on it when it comes out. But uh, until then, I have no idea. Um, but we've done most everything else. So what do I think of it? Um, it is a solid, solid upgrade to the AC200 Max. There's a couple of things, mostly nits, where they sort of cheapened out. You know, they didn't put the wireless charging pads on the top, but a wireless charging pad is $10, $10 so eh, I can buy one. Not that worried about it. Um, they didn't put the uh, 5521 barrel jack ports on there, but at the same time, you know, eh, I can figure it out once I figure out how to get that 48 volt port to work. Um, am I going to run and immediately replace the uh, AC200 Max that I keep in my camper? with an AC200L. Uh, not yet. And the reason I say not yet is because I need to figure out how this DC 48 volt port is going to work in regards to hooking it into the camper, specifically with the 12 volt system. Um, I draw way more power. I cannot run my entire camper off a cigarette lighter port. It's not going to happen. Uh, not where there's just way too much DC stuff that I run in there. Uh, heck, even the little fan on the, on the roof of the camper, you draw more power than that. But until I figure out how to get that to work and until those cables are available, no, the AC200L can't yet replace the AC200 Max. Uh, but it can replace it for many other use cases um, outside the camper. Uh, it's much faster to recharge. It's much quieter to recharge. It's a much nicer use it around the house type unit um, just on the AC side than the AC200 Max is simply because the AC200 Max is awkward to recharge. Um, it can handle a larger solar array in a single solar array situation. AC200 Max, if I want to put 1200 watts into it, and you can, um, you have to use a DC charging enhancer, which means you have to have now have two solar arrays, which is kind of a pain. Uh, the single array, the 1200 watt single array, it's much easier to just plug it into one of the arrays that I have uh, laying around, because I have solar arrays laying around, because I'm like that. Uh, and I can plug it into one of those and recharge it off solar much easier. So yeah, definitely a solid upgrade. Um, and the uh, pricing on them right now is, uh, uh, I want to say insanity, <laughs> but uh, very, very, very attractive pricing on this device. So uh, if you want one, my suggestion would be uh, don't wait. Don't wait too long because certainly the price is going to go up at some point. I think they're selling them for right about near what it's costing them to make them. So I, I don't know how that's sustainable. This price is, they're going to have to go up at some point. But uh, it kind of is what it is there. Um, good, solid unit. Um, just uh, got to figure out the DC side before I'm going to commit to it in the camper, though. So, as always, um, I am not paid to make these videos. Uh, Blue Eddie does not pay me. Um, you can notice that their monetization on this channel is not turned on, and I have no plans of turning it on. I don't make money on solar generators. I do make money in tech. Uh, but I don't make money on anything that competes with solar generators or anywhere in the consumer product space. So my money comes from elsewhere. Uh, I make these videos because they're fun to make. Uh, obviously, uh, Bluetti had to send me the device. I've been testing it for um, many, many hundreds of hours. And if I didn't get the device early, there would be no way I could actually make this video, not in the time frame that I'm doing it. So I will call out they sent the device. Uh, they're not paying me to do this. Um, I get no compensation from this. I'm not even 100% sure if I get to keep it or not. Maybe I do. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not in it for the money. Um, this is just fun for me to do and fun for you guys to watch. And as long as you guys keep enjoying watching it, I will keep making them. So have fun, everybody.